Welcome to another episode of Bloody Betrayal and Works of Darkness. I'm your host, Frankie Seal. 1970 through 1972 saw a dramatic increase of politically motivated violence in Northern Ireland, peaking in 1972, when nearly 500 people lost their lives. Over half of them were civilians. This event has become to be known as Bloody Sunday. The superstar rock band U2 have recorded a hit song over the tragedy. The violence was not contained to Irish shores, since there are many people sympathetic to the cause of the IRA in many different countries. One particular event took place on the other side of the world. Two bombs were planted in an attempt to assassinate Prince Philip in 1973. They were discovered and diffused. They were hidden in a bin along the route of the Royal Motorcade and at Sydney in a rail station. I could not find any specific information about the bombs, but at the time the IRA was typically using a combination of diesel fuel and fertilizer. The bombs would have been triggered by a remote radio detonator. These detonators were favored since the assailant could remain hidden from passers-by trigger the explosive, inspect the collateral damage, and then escape without drawing attention to themselves. The attempted assassination has a wealth of suspects, but no convictions. We know that several important figures in the IRA were traveling back and forth from the UK to Australia. There were definitely people in Australia that were sympathetic to their cause. Australia was the second largest foreign financer of Sinn Féin after the United States. If the attempted assassination was masterminded by a leading figure in the IRA, they would have needed local support to carry out the actual bomb production and placement. It's fairly safe to assume that there was some type of an IRA cell present in Australia at the time. Without a confession or an eyewitness, it's virtually impossible to make a conviction. The materials used in the bomb are relatively commonplace, therefore almost impossible to trace. The detonator uses radio parts which are available in an electronic shop, repair shop, or even salvaged from old radios. Since this event was widely publicized, virtually anyone with motive could have planted the bombs. Could this have been a test run for another bomb attack on the royal family? It's difficult to determine. By this date, the IRA had become very efficient at bomb production. They had virtually perfected a radio detonator. In 1979, Lord Mountbatten, his grandson Nicholas, and two others were murdered by a bomb set by members of the Provisional Irish Republican Army. It was hidden aboard his fishing boat in Mullockmore Island. Lord Mountbatten had bodyguards to ensure his safety. However, his boat was left in the harbour unattended. Mountbatten often holidayed at a summer home, Castle Braun Castle, near a small seaside village. The village was only 12 miles from the border with Northern Ireland and near an area known to be used as a cross-border refuge by IRA members. On the evening of August 26, 1979, IRA member Thomas McMahon had slipped into the unguarded boat and attached a radio-controlled bomb weighing 50 pounds. The next day, Lord Mountbatten and a small group of people went out onto the water, lobster potting and fishing in his wooden boat, Shadow Five. When Mountbatten was aboard, just a short distance from the shore, the bomb was detonated. The boat was destroyed by the force of the blast. His elder daughter, Lady Brayburn, her husband, Lord Brayburn, and their twin sons, Nicholas and Timothy, and Paul Maxwell, a young crew member were also aboard the boat. The bomb was successful in ending their lives. The IRA issued a statement afterwards saying, 
the IRA claim responsibility for the execution of Lord William Mumpat. This operation is one of the discriminant ways we can bring to the attention of the English people the continuing occupation of our country. The death of Mountbatten and the tributes paid to him will be seen in sharp contrast to the apathy of the British government and the English people to the deaths of over 300 British soldiers and the deaths of Irish men, women and children at the hands of their forces. Six weeks later, Sinn Féin Vice President Jerry Adams said of Mountbatten's death, the IRA give clear reasons for the execution. I think it's unfortunate that anyone has to be killed, but the fervor created by Mountbatten's death showed the hypocritical attitude of the media establishment. As a member of the House of Lords, Mountbatten is an emotional figure in both British and Irish politics. What the IRA did to him is what Mountbatten had been doing all his life to other people. And with his war record, I don't think he could have objected to dying in what was clearly a war situation. He knew the danger involved coming to this country. In my opinion, the IRA achieved its objective. People started paying attention to what was happening in Ireland. In May 2015, during a meeting with Prince Charles, Adams did not apologize. He later said in an interview, I stand over what I said then. I'm not one of those people that engages in revisionism. Thankfully, the war is over. On the day of the bombing, the IRA also ambushed and killed 18 members of the British Army in Northern Ireland, 16 of them from the Parachute Regiment. The Parachute Regiment was probably chosen as a target since they were often in the thick of things with conflicts between the IRA and the military. They were also the perpetrators in the Bloody Sunday Massacre. This was the deadliest attack on the army by the IRA. It has subsequently been called the Warren Point Ambush, named after the point on the road in which the attack took place. Labeling the conflict as a religious conflict is not entirely correct. At first glance, it looked like it was between Catholics and Protestants. Irish nationalists wanted to leave the United Kingdom to join the United Ireland. They were primarily Catholic. Unionists wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom, were mostly Protestants. Irish people are often passionate about their faith. By focusing on the faith differences, leaders saw many people supporting their cause. The conflict began in the late 1960s. It is commonly accepted to have ended with the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. I remember growing up during this time. It seemed like there would never be an end to the violence. Thankfully, people were able to close the book on this bloody conflict. As for the attempted assassination of Prince Philip, unless somebody comes forward and makes a confession, I don't think we'll ever know who the perpetrators were. I'm not making any accusations in this case, nor do I mean to shed a bad light on anyone. I'm only providing information on the case that's publicly available. Acts of terrorism are meant to shock people, thereby attracting people to the cause that the terrorists are fighting. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I truly enjoy putting together a new episode for you each week. If you'd like me to feature a case, or you'd like to hear more of a certain type of podcast, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, at Frankie Seal. I always enjoy hearing from my listeners. If you're not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing to my channel. It's free, and it helps me to see how many regular listeners I have. Until the next time, take care, and goodbye.